Hi, everyone. I have eagerly desired to eat this meal with you. You guys ready to go to work? I think one of the mistakes that we make with the Bible is that we often assume that it was written by people who think like 21st century Americans. Um, and, And it's not that we think wrong, it's just that the people who wrote the Bible don't think the way we think. And so understanding that actually gives us opportunity to understand the Bible in its depth. Um, the Bible was written by an ancient group of Eastern-minded people, and, and what that means is when they write something, it's never just about what they wrote. Like, yes, what they wrote on the surface is, that's true, but also there's layers, there's stories below the story that are going on that if we explore those, give us color and depth and power and wonder and meaning to our relationship with the Lord. And so today, what I want to do is I want to take a walk through one of those narratives that I think are particularly important. I've titled this sermon, John, Jacob, Jesus, and the Whole Gospel. Uh, And it kicks off the song, right? John, Jacob, Jesus, and the Whole Gospel. Now you'll never forget it. (laughs) Um, There's a rule about this, though. Like, if you want to start exploring the layers and doing all this stuff, that's good, that's important, but you don't get to just do it any way you want to. There's some rules to it. Uh, I want to begin by reading Deuteronomy 19.15. This is a law. It comes out of Torah. Here's what it says. A single witness shall not (coughs) suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. Now, here's the deal. That, that's, a, that's true on crime and conviction in, in the law code. But beyond that, this principle generally becomes true in Jewish culture around confirming the point that someone is trying to make. You can't just do it once. you got to do it with either two or three witnesses. And so we want to be looking, as we're looking for these stories going on below the story, you don't just get to make one up. you you got to actually confirm it with multiple spaces of witnesses. And so that's what we're going to do today with the first five chapters of John. No big deal. We're just going to cover five chapters of the Bible today. And I want to immerse us deep into the text and see if there isn't something that we can learn for you and me. Here's what John chapter 1 says. It says, The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida and the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found the one of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And yes, I'd love to pull that apart for you. It's another sermon for another day. We have five chapters to cover. Um, Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Okay, that's a... I I would not introduce myself to you that way. Like, that's a weird statement to make. Unless there's something going on below the surface here. We'll take a look at it. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, that has two possible meanings. It could mean that Nathaniel was sitting under a fig tree. But sitting under a fig tree was also a metaphor for sitting under a rabbi. And the idea is that the figs, being one of only two sweet things in the ancient world, would fall. And as you catch those, you eat and are blessed by the sweet things that the rabbi gives you. So it could mean that he's just sitting under a fig tree. It could mean that Jesus saw him when he was sitting under his rabbi. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of it. That feels like a dramatic response. You saw me. Wow, that's amazing. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe you'll see greater things than these? And he said to him, truly, truly. And anytime you repeat that, we're going to like, this is something you really need to pay attention to. I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay, what's going on here? Well, 
What's happening in this conversation is John is introducing us to a section of the Old Testament around the story of Jacob. You think, of course, I totally picked that up. Right? Here's what I want to talk to you about. Now, we need two witnesses, right? Can't just make that up. We need two witnesses. Here's the first Jacob reference. Psalm 32, which you all, we all immediately were like, yeah, Psalm 32, of course. Um, Psalm 32 says this, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, <clears throat> whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So when Jesus looks at Nathaniel and says, here's a Is- true Israelite in whom there is no deceit, it's a throwback, it's a quote of Psalm 32, verse 2, which still raises the question, how does that get us to Jacob? Here's how it gets us to Jacob. I want to read for you the Midrash around Psalm 32. And if you're like, what in the world is Midrash? Think Jewish commentary. Now, it's not a one-to-one comparison, but it'll get you very close to the idea of Midrash. We have commentary that we read around the Bible. So we read the Bible and then we read commentary, which is other people's kind of notes around their thoughts around the, that section of Scripture. Midrash is kind of the same thing. Here's what the Midrash for Psalm 32 says. Just basically just verse 1 and 2. This you will find to be so in the case of Jacob, of whom it is written, Jacob was a perfect man dwelling in tents, a perfect man in the performance of good deeds, dwelling in tents, devoting himself to the Torah, and full of precepts. Camps of angels were assigned to watch over him. As it is said, and Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him, and Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp, and he called the name of that place Mahanaim. And it says also, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it, and behold, the Lord stood beside him and said, behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee. So here's our first reference. Our first witness to Jacob, behold, here's an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. Okay? We need how many? We need two witnesses. Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 to 17, here's what it says. Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran, and he came to a certain place, which by the way, I would, there's a whole sermon around that, those two words, certain place. What? I'll give you a highlight. I don't, I don't have time to pull it really apart, but here's the thing. In the ancient world, gods are they're attached to things. It's the god of a tree or a temple or a rock. Gods are there. They're not just in random places everywhere. So the fact that God met him in a no-name place is revolutionary. And he stayed there that night because the sun had set, and taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep because we all know how comfortable it is to use a stone for a pillow. And he dreamed and beheld, he didn't sleep real deeply, so he's having these dreams. Behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I'm the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go. And and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I, I was not aware of it. This is not a good translation. The word I is repeated, which actually dramatically matters. And it's not often translated because they're like, we don't know what to do with that. Um, and he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So this is the the gate of heaven. So here's our second Jacob reference. So beholders and Israelites in whom there is no deceit, and you'll see greater things than these. You'll see the the son of man, uh, angels ascending and descending on the son of man, which, yes, son of God and son of man, those labels actually matter. Another sermon for another day. Here's the thing. John, in 
chapter 1, right at the end of his first chapter, has given us two points to Jacob. And the question is, why? Why is he doing this? What, what do we need to pay attention to? Here's the answer, and this is my central premise, is it's because John is trying to show his readers why he's in Asia Minor. Think about this. Israel, from a Roman Empire perspective, is a, it's a backwater. It's like there's nothing significant. It's this little tiny place kind of out on the, on the eastern edge of the empire, and it's just there as a buffer between Rome and Parthia. Um, it's not really much going on there. So this, but John, who grew up there, travels thousands of miles to Ephesus, which is one of the cultural centers of the world, to give his life to this message that will ultimately get him killed. Why does he care so much about that? John is writing his gospel towards the end of his ministry. And so this is like him justifying why he spent his life there. Which still doesn't answer why we need two connections to Jacob. Here we go. Ready? Let me give you an overview of a piece, a section out of the life of Jacob. Now remember, Jacob goes to Laban, so he grows up and, and he needs a wife. So he goes to Laban, who's his uncle, in order to find himself a wife. And he meets Rachel, and he wants to marry her because she is... She is pretty. Uh, so Jacob enters into a covenant with Laban to work for seven years for Rachel's hand in marriage. In Genesis 29, 20, it's the most romantic verse in the whole Bible. Here's what it says. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Aww. Right? So here's the deal, guys. The next time you're on a date night with your wife, baby, baby, I was spending time with the Lord, which she's already going to find hot. And you're like, I've read this verse, and it reminded me of our marriage and how much I love you. <laughs> the 30 years we've spent together have been like a few days because of my love for you. Now, at the end of that seven years, Laban tricks Jacob and gives him Leah, the wife he doesn't want, as a wife instead of Rachel. So Leah is Rachel's older sister, and Leah's got some issues. Here's what it says, Genesis 29, 17. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful <coughs> in form and appearance. Now, that's an odd comparison, right? It's an odd comparison. Um, people have translated it a lot of different ways, this weak eyes thing. Uh, some people have said she was cross-eyed. Some people have said um, she was blind. Um, what's going on with this? Let, let's pull it apart. So the first Hebrew word is the word rach. Let me hear you say rach. Yeah, it means tender or weak or delicate, especially in body. Some people call it timid, um, somebody who's kind of pulled back. The other word is the word ayin, say ayin. And it, and it does mean I, it does. Um, it's translated I 495 times in the Old Testament, but it's also translated 216 times, it's translated sight. It's translated face 10 times, and it's translated presence eight times, like your being, your presence, uh, the aura that you give off. So here's the thing. In light of the comparison of Rachel to Leah, we have to figure out like kind of what's going on there. What's the best translation of that word? And, and so, you know, Rachel is beautiful in form and appearance. The phrase probably for Leah that I would say is best represents what's trying to be get at is that she was weak faced. <laughs> she's ugly. It's a biblical way to say she's ugly. Leah, Leah's weak faced, Rachel's smoking hot. Like that's the Aaron Couch paraphrase version. Not yet available for print. Um, but that's, that's what's 
That's the comparison. And he does, he's not attracted to her. He doesn't want her as, he wants Rachel. Rachel's the one that he loves. Rachel's the one that he's drawn to. Rachel is the one that he gives his affection to. However, this is important. Jacob agrees to work for another seven years for Rachel, the wife that he does want. And he works for her that, to, to have her as well. But here's the thing. Even though Leah is the wife that he doesn't want, he takes care of her. And, and he has children with her, which raises a myriad of questions. But his affection and his attention and his heart is for Rachel. So he's not neglecting Leah, but he's certainly not doting on her either. Does that make sense? And this is actually significant. Now, why does John tie us to Jacob here? And how do we know that this is the section of Jacob's life that we need to be paying attention to anyway? It, wh- how do we, there's so many questions, right? And I know you guys are all asking them. You're like, where are you even going with this? Hang with me. Here's how we know this is the section. What's the next story? So we have two references to Jacob, and the next story is John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Now, Cana in Hebrew is Cana. means desire, fire. Um, the zealots were called Canaim. These people of passion. Cana is a zealot village. And so we step into this space at a wedding. And if this is connected to, J- to Jacob and his weddings, we might assume that at this wedding, this first wedding, what kind of bride do we have here? This is a bride that he doesn't want. Because that's his first wedding. Third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. And Jesus said to her, so? What does that have to do with me? My my hour has not yet come. Now, what does that even mean? Because Yes, it has. You've, you're, you've chosen disciples. You started your ministry. Yep. You are. What is he saying here? What, is he, what he's saying here is, I don't want to reveal the, my capacity to do miracles for these people. Why? Because this isn't the bride that I want. And Mary fires back at him. Now, there's a lot of speculation about exactly what's going on here, but a lot of people just see her as this little old Yiddish woman that's like, do whatever he t-. Like, he doesn't even pay attention. You know, she's like trying to pacify him, and but move on. Here's what I believe is happening. If Jesus is making a statement about the bride that he doesn't want, she looks at him and goes, Jesus, you don't get to neglect them. I know this isn't your mission, but you don't get to bail out on them either. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. In my opinion, she is glaring at Jesus while she's saying this. Now, there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And you know the story. Um, Jesus does the wine, they take it out, and they're like, hey, normally people get the best wine early, and then after everybody's drunk and doesn't care, they bring out the cheap stuff. But you, you save the best for last. So Jesus doesn't just give them box wine. Like, it's this is good stuff. This is the good stuff. Interesting. But if we're going to confirm this, how many witnesses do we need? Two. What's the next story? The next story 
It's about the bride that Jesus doesn't want as well. John chapter 2, 13 to 17. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there and making a whip out of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. Now, a lot of people look at that like made a whip out of cords, and then we think about it like the man from Snowy River. You guys remember that movie? That's a deep cut. So for a lot of you, you're like, I wasn't alive when that movie came out. Um, it's true. But there's this moment in the movie where uh, they're chasing this herd of wild horses and they go over the ridge and, and they, can't, they can't do it, man. So they all stop, right? But they conveniently part an aisleway down the middle because here comes a man from Snowy River who conveniently happens to be in last place. And then he goes over the edge and while he's going over, he takes his whip out. and It's very dramatic. And we're all like, he's the man, the man from Snowy River. <laughs> and that's why I don't do accents. Anyway, so he, so he's, that's what we often see when we see Jesus here. This is not that kind of a thing. When it says that he makes a whip out of cords, what this is, that's a rabbinic expression that says that Jesus has grabbed the tassel on his robe and he's shaking his tassel in their face. Why? Because their tassel is their sense of identity. What Jesus is saying is, you've lost your sense of yourself. You've lost who you are. Now, here's the interesting thing. Most scholars agree that there's only one cleansing of the temple in Jesus' ministry. Matthew puts it at the end of his gospel. John puts it at the beginning of his gospel. Why does John move it there? Because maybe John's trying to leverage this to illustrate the point that this is why this is the bride he doesn't want. Because they, not because he doesn't love them, but because they've lost their identity. They're not living out the beautifulness of what the bride of Christ is supposed to be. They're weak-faced. Now, if we really need to drive this home, let's get three witnesses. By the way, um, when John wrote this, he didn't have chapters and verses just so that you know, he was just writing one story, one story, one story. So he went ahead and gave us three witnesses. Um, let me go ahead and skip ahead here. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And the man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, anytime he says that, you better pay attention. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? And the far more important question, in my opinion, is what mom would want him to try? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, this whole conversation that he's going to go on to have with Nicodemus is all about identity. It's all about reclaiming what you were intended to be in the beginning. It's all about who they were supposed to be when they came out of Egypt. They were born out of Egypt as firstborn of all creation, his child. They were born anew. And Jesus says, you've lost the plot, Nicodemus. The problem is you guys are representing God in a way that he should not be represented. You've become weak-faced. Interesting, but it gets even better. If we keep going on in John chapter 3, just keep reading it, John 3, 25 to 30, it says that now discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. Now, which John is this? This is John the Baptist. And here's a question. John in his gospel, John the Apostle in his gospel, talks more about John the Baptist than any of the other gospel writers. Why is that? Here's an interesting thing. Paul, the apostle, is going to show up in Ephesus 40 years before this is written, this gospel. 
And when he shows up, the, some of the first people that he runs into are disciples of John the Baptist. Like somehow, very early on in the Jesus movement, disciples of John the Baptist have made their way all the way to Ephesus. And they're there doing work, taking root, spreading the gospel. And so to leverage these people, like at the beginning of the very, all of it, John himself had this conversation. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you is across the Jordan to whom you bore witness. Look, he's baptizing all the, uh, and all the people are going to him. He's taking all your recruits. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. Okay, more wedding imagery? So if the, if the first wedding is the bride that he doesn't want, and the, the second wedding should be who? The bride that he does want. The, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear his, hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. By the way, I'd love to pull that apart for you, but you're going to have to come with me to Israel. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase and I must decrease. So if we, okay, so we have the wedding, and then the bride that he doesn't want. He cleanses the temple, and he has a conversation with Nicodemus. Then we have more wedding imagery, and now we should get a picture of what kind of bride does Jesus find beautiful. John chapter 4. And when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. By the way, that's not true. None of the Jews would pass through Samaria. They'd walk around it. But not Jesus. He had to. Why? Because he's going to meet somebody there that's exactly the kind of bride he's looking for. So we came to the town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And by the way, more Jacob references just to make sure you know where we're at. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. By the way, I had so much to say about Jesus wearied from his journey. His disciples seemed to be full of vim and vigor. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Okay, let me ask you this question. In what world do you send 12 people to town for 13 people's lunch? <laughs> or is there something else going on here? The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. This is exactly the kind of bride Jesus is looking for. Not somebody who has it all figured out, religiously upright, proper. Not somebody who understands how to play the religious game and looks like they follow the rules, but their heart is dead inside. Not somebody like that at all. Somebody who's broken. Somebody who's been divorced five times and is living with a guy right now who's not her husband. Somebody who, by all accounts, doesn't look like she has a whole lot of friends. That's exactly the kind of bride he's looking for. Not somebody who's... You know, that's interesting. We've got to have two witnesses. Good news. John chapter 5. 
After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which had five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who'd been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Which, let's pause the story. I think that's kind of a dumb question. Now, he's Jesus and I'm not, but do you want to be healed? Nope, rather stay broke. Um, But before we get too far off the deep end on that, be careful when we look in the mirror. Because I think we choose broke more than we choose healing and freedom. See, I think ultimately what we're going to realize is that in our brokenness, Jesus doesn't see us as ugly. He sees us as Rachel. But you don't get to stay broke. You don't get to choose broke. We get to choose healing. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water's stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. There's a whole tradition around that. Again, come with me to Israel. Um, Jesus said to him, Get up. Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he walked. And that is exactly the kind of bride that Jesus is looking for. There's a quote. um, Brant Hansen wrote a great book called Blessed Are the Misfits. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, Here's what it says. When Jesus walked among us, it's how he demonstrated his very identity. The lame man walks. A girl is raised from the dead. No, I do not want to walk away from this. On the contrary, I want to be part of it. Jesus, in his very ministry, is drawn to the broken, the hurting, the misplaced, the misunderstood, the ones who don't feel like they fit anywhere. This is the bride Jesus is looking for. This is the bride Jesus is looking for. Not the ones who are pretty and plastic and have it all figured out and have it together. Not those, because God's power is not displayed in that. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. That's what Jesus said. From the beginning of his... Now, here's the thing. The danger is we go, well, if that's true, then I'm just going to stay broke. No, what you do is give your life to Jesus and allow him to do his work in you so that freedom can happen because he doesn't just die to save you. He also dies to heal you and set you free so that your life can have meaning and purpose and freedom and hope and a reason to get out of bed. All of that comes from our relationship with Jesus. This is exactly the kind of bride. And I've had so many people, like I just, I see to clean myself up. I'm going to clean myself up and then I'll go. That's not the kind of bride Jesus is looking for. Not the ones that are cleaned up. He's looking for the messy ones. He's looking for the ones that don't fit neatly into the puzzle of religiosity. I've had people say, well, listen, I'm sure you've heard this too because you guys are all inviting all your friends all the time. If I came through the doors of church, a building would fall down. (laughs) Tell them, tell them this. If that happens, we will rebuild. (laughs) Uh, if, If somebody's so sinful that when they come through the doors of the church, that the, the building collapses, we will celebrate that you're here and we will rebuild. Because you're exactly the kind of bride that Jesus is looking for. And he sees you as beautiful Messed up, broken, yep, 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 and beautiful. 
And that's so significant for us because we often, we try to measure like, how does Jesus see me? We try to measure, well, I think he sees you this way because I see you this way and you're here and I'm here. Or, or we try to flip the, you know, I'm here and you're here. We're trying to measure ourselves against people. That's not the kind of bride Jesus is looking for. What he's looking for is the tax collector praying in the, in the temple uh, mount, Lord, be, be kind to me, a sinner. Be gracious to me without even being able to, the, the reality that, listen, no matter how long we walk with Christ, it, yes, there's a process of growing and sanctification and, and becoming more whole. Yes, there is all of those things. And at the end, we're still broken. And if we ever get to the place where we miss our, de- our ultimate dependence on Jesus for anything good, then we become confident in our own ability. And that's super dangerous because that's weak-faced to Jesus. I have some implications for us this morning. Um, Number one, all of us have the potential to act in ways that are unbecoming of the bride of Christ. We all have that potential. No matter how long we've been walking with Jesus, we all have the potential to act in ways that are unbecoming of the bride of Christ. We all have our moments. So we can't ever get to the place where we look at somebody who's not acting like the bride of Christ and we put our nose in the air as if somehow we're better than them. Because I'm not. I'm samesies. Implication number two. John is in Asia Minor because he's compelled to love the same types of people that Jesus modeled loving. The broken, the sick, the pagans, the ones who are sacrificing their identity and lives and everything in the name of false gods. The ones who are doing all kinds of depraved activities. Those are the ones Jesus modeled loving. And John's like, I got to go where they are. And so he picks Ephesus, which you couldn't have picked a better city. That's why he's in Asia Minor. To love the ones that nobody else wants to love. Just offer something for your consideration as you sit and look in the mirror at your own Christian journey. Does yours model and imitate what we see modeled for us? Or are we trying to build a plastic bubble of safety of religion? Implication number three. Jesus never asked us to get things figured out. He just asked us to follow him. And then let him do the work in us. As we surrender to him, he does the work in us to change us. Implication number four. To the misfits, miscreants, discouraged, despondent, distracted, and disengaged, God loves you. To the broken, beaten, uncertain, unfamiliar, made fun of, the brushed aside and unstewarded, together as a community of faith, we are exactly the kind of bride that Jesus is looking for. Jonathan Martin, in his book, The Prototype, says this, the fact that we carry what may seem to be unsightly scars does not disqualify us from following Jesus. It may be precisely what qualifies us. This is a beautiful sermon stepping into the Advent season because the Advent is all about Jesus showing up to meet us in the stables of our life, not the castles. Are we willing to meet him where he is? Because Jesus is inviting us to our broken places. He wants to meet us there. We're not, we don't need to put up a front with Jesus. We don't need to pretend like we're something that we're not with Jesus. He wants to meet us in our brokenness. Are we willing to go there? Because that's exactly the kind of bride that Jesus wants. 
And as we move into our communion time, we take communion every week together as a church family, but as we move into our communion time, I would just invite us to consider that. Like, where are we trying to be fixed before God? Isaiah says that even our righteousness is like filthy rags to him. Like, who can stand for the holiness of God? It's simply his goodness and kindness and grace. Where are we playing games with Jesus? Let's spend some time talking with the Lord about that as we get our hearts ready to take communion together. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. So whenever you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. And then in the same way after the dinner, he took a cup and he said, this cup, this is the blood of the covenant which is shed for you. So whenever you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your grace. God, thank you that the messy <laughs> messy places of our lives don't disqualify us in your mind. When we're willing to get honest about that, it's just exactly the kind of person that you're looking to follow you. God, may we trust you for who you really are and for who we really are. And may we never become proud in our ability to stand before you, God. Thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen.